We are swapping this modern Mark 7 GTI engine into an old Jetta to make what the Fast and the Furious car should have been. In our last three episodes, we completed everything we needed to get the car running. And when it was time for the moment of truth, the car wouldn't start. We have to get this car running before we can strip it for paint, which means we have to continue working on it until we can figure out what's wrong with it. This is part four of our five episode series sponsored by our friends at Liquamale and Unitronic. What Paul is doing is actually changing the order in which he powers up these different wires. They have to go on in a certain sequence, otherwise the car won't start. Part A has to get power, then part B has to get power. If you flip them, then it won't work right. So Paul's gonna try and crank it and I'm gonna watch for this test light to light up. So, I got no test light up. Yeah, I'm not getting power back here to the pump side. Let me check. It's called, oh, yep. I got power on the ground. Okay. I hear pump. Oh, oh Well. <laughs> well. How much? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. Hey, yeah, uh, we, we do. We got fuel. We got fuel. We got spark. We got all What just things. happened? You know, well, it was a little bit of a, a fuel geyser that just. <laughs> phew, yeah, oh, it's going to smell like fuel for the rest of the day. You know? <laughs> okay, so here's what we've learned. We did, in fact, have the wiring to the fuel pump backwards. Now that we don't have that, we also, we also <laughs> learned that the clamp to the fuel line wasn't safe. No, 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 no. It's on the return, not on the... Oh. Not, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not that oh, it's, it's not on tight. That, it's buddy. not on at all. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what's going on here. So earlier you thought, wow, these guys are just idiots when it comes to wiring. Nope, there's so much more than We're <laughs> idiots it's everywhere, not Literal, just in wiring. All the things. Now I have a feeling it's gonna start. All right, wait, before we do that, should we check to see if we have any other stupidity going on? Nope. <laughs> Send it, let's nope. go. Here we go. Now all we gotta do is actually fix it. Okay, so <laughs> let's recap that real quick. Initially what we tried to do is hook everything into the Mark III and just hit it with the key. We could have wired that for a century and it would have never worked because we didn't have the fuel pump hooked up right. Uh -huh. So now we know our engine starts. Now what we need to do is essentially take those four wires and whatever you wanna call this nonsense and mate them up to the car so that we can start it with a key, not this series of Paul grass keys. nest. What do we got? We got a oh, problem we got a little fuel leakage at the back. Oh, that's okay. Uh oh. It's definitely the filter. It, it might be that hose. Bro. You think so? That hose looks real. Not I mean, happy. it's not looking great because it's probably what thirty years old. So yeah. it's gonna stink like gas in here. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna huff some fumes. We have fixed the fuel leak in the front and the fuel leak in the back. If you watch our inspection video when we first bought this car, this car did not start with the key. You had to actually turn the key on, then push a button to make it start. The reason most people do that is because the ignition switches are a super common failure on this car. Not only ignition switch, but alarm module. So when we tried to start it before with the key, when we thought we had it all wired up, but we had it wrong, but we also had the fuel pump not connected right, we also had a bad ignition switch. So we have a new ignition switch with some, uh, we'll call them test probes test probes in there, and we're gonna try to start it. Nothing happened. One more ground? Two more grounds. <laughs> this ground situation is a nightmare. Is. This, I'll tell you, this is the last time this ground thing is gonna be a problem. This is a octopus of grounds. We have gathered them all together to try to give them ground because electricity needs a ground. Well, there, well, there we go. This has been a problem that has plagued us for the entire time we've been working on this car. Round six. Uh-oh. Are we missing something? <laughs> <laughs> Do I got my fuel pump ground? Where's my fuel pump ground? <laughs> Is your fuel pump ground? Hold on. Oh, it's, still, it's still grounded. We have cranked the engine with sort of the car, you know, you just need a screwdriver and this thing dangling. 
Oh, something happened. Right now we're gonna try to drive this car today. So we gotta finalize our battery relocation because sitting a battery on top of here where it, like it was sitting on top of the star connector and it might snap that off and stuff isn't gonna work. So <laughs> we're gonna finish the battery relocation. <laughs> and so we're gonna take these wires and then put them at the junction block that I made down there. And in the rear we have our battery relocation, obviously all the cables and stuff that go to it. And then we also welded a stud that Steve helped us mount back here for a ground. Not only are they the longest bolts, they're not even threaded all the way, so he's gonna get a nut to about here. And then it's, gonna, it's, not, it's not mounted, damn it. They're placeholder bolts. See, this is different. The last project, he was the one that could stand on the sideline and just talk trash. Now the tides have turned, and I'm feeling real good about See, yeah, it. The have turned. Basically, up until this point, nothing was tight. All the bolts that we had touched throughout this whole project were loose. So we're tightening what we remember and we're probably gonna miss some stuff if I had to guess. Then we're gonna take this old girl on her maiden voyage. And that's pretty exciting, I gotta say. I'm feeling good. Feeling strong, <laughs> feeling brave, a lot brave. Okay, <laughs> much brave. <laughs> Paul's handling business do think, here. Do you think y'all tighten everything? No. Remember that ground issue we had like a hundred times? Right we're about now. to have that with bolts being tight. Maybe. Oh no! Nice. It might be a bad ground. <laughs> of course it's. <laughs> Ooh, wait! Oh, I forgot I gotta hold got... the screwdriver. Oh, no. <laughs> the whole time we're gonna have to hold it in. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> we're not moving. We're not moving. We got no gears. We might have to go back to the drawing board in this particular situation. I jumped the brake light switch. So we're gonna see if it needs maybe brake light switch signal to go into gear. So we pulled up OBD 11 with our car. This is our Mark 7 here. If you, that looks familiar to our Mark 7 cause that's Hellboy's car. <laughs> and Hellboy is apparently who wrecked his car and we bought it. So you're probably thinking, wow, that was a really short test drive and you'd be right, we actually just pushed it a few feet forward. So what happened was we put it in reverse and the car wouldn't move. Tried to go forward, car wouldn't move. When we scanned the TCM, we found out that we actually have transmission locked out faults, which is a safety protocol and we need to overcome that. Unfortunately, there's no overcoming that right now. So rather than wasting a bunch of time doing that, we have to do everything before this car goes to paint. We have very little time left for us to get this to the shows for this year. The goal is to get this done for Wookiees in the Woods originally. That's not gonna happen. We're shooting for Alpine, but we need to get this car to the body shop. So we have to get to work and not worry about test driving and hope and pray we can figure that out later. I was doing the wiring underneath our dash, stripping this wire so I could splice into it, and I gave it a little tug tug and pulled this whole wire out. Someone had taken this section way here and they just said, boop, 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 boop. And this is probably the reason for all the starting problems this car had. People at home, if you wanna repair wiring, these are really cheap. So don't just twist wires together inside of a car because the reason why this exists is because your car vibrates like this, going down the road. And so what happens is, is if you have two wires that are just twisted together like this, they'll and then fall apart like, like that. So we've been working on this car for a few months. Let's get you up to speed as to what's going on. We've done nothing at this point to make this car aesthetically look better because we've been working on fabrication and modifications that could damage anywhere on the car. So we're avoiding painting it until all that's done. We also have been working on getting this wiring cleaned up. You can see we loosely taped and banded together these clumps of sections to get it roughly where it needs to be. That might look terrible to you, but that's gonna look good once we get the factory tape on there and make it all nicey nice when we're going back together with the car. We've also worked out our cooling system. You can see the coolant bottle here, coolant hose here, these custom radiator hoses, and then our radiator, which is not mounted on top currently, but you can see that looking real nice. I also spent loads of time with Steve fabricating this tabs right here for this duct, as well as the intake and then the intake bracket that I also made as well. 
in the interior, we have everything kind of staged similar to how we have it under the hood. And what's cool is we can now start the car with the key. We also rekey the ignition so that all the lock cylinders will have matching locks on all of them which will be pretty nice considering there were three keys when we started this car before. In preparation for getting this car painted and cleaned up, I've stripped out the rear of the car. As you can see, I've made a complete mess of this. 90% me. Yeah, I like 10% of the mess credit for this. Yeah. So I've spent many, many months working on this car, way more hours than I would like to admit. Done all that to put the car together to get us to today. Now, we have to take the car back apart so we can get it to paint engine and all of this is going to come back out of the car so the bay can get sprayed probably window seals and a bunch of more interior stuff out so they can do a good job painting because race car so this is the jetta fast and the furious body kit we're going to mock it up and see how it looks on the car in a typical early 2000s mods you can see a gigantic spoiler is an absolute must so is this what Jesse had on his car? This is exactly what he has on his car. This is what made him lose. This is a pretty cool spoiler. Would you put this on your Jetta if you weren't doing a Fast and the Furious build? Absolutely would. And as you can see, here is our rear valance. This is this one that was used on the movie car. They had different exhaust tips. They didn't have a three inch exhaust and uh, we might have to make some changes here. Side skirts are gonna mount on the side because the lift is there. We're not gonna mock them up. And let's look at the front. Then it go just like this. Mm. So fast, it's but gonna, only a little furious. It's got a little ramp here. It's gonna funnel air right into our inner cooler. And rocks. Now we're done messing around. We're ready to get this engine out of the car. Now we got that engine out, we have to get this thing ready to roll on its own weight. This is what's gonna be needed to do that. This is the axle from the old one we cut off, and so what you do is you have to support the wheel bearing. So you take that axle end, you put it in, and add that washer in there. And then once we tighten that in, we can now roll the car back and forth without damaging the wheel bearing, because you need that. Now we're gonna get the subframe in so that we can connect the suspension so the car can actually sit on its own weight. Right now, we're gonna put it in a bag so that we can send it to paint and not get it all painted on. I'll probably double bag, just in case. You gotta never be too careful, so you always double bag. Doesn't create friction at all. Look at that. If you look around, you can see the paint is really rough on this car, and it's the same along here. And since we're painting the engine bay, basically, it has to be completely empty. We can remove whatever we want, but what we leave might get painted on. This brake booster and master cylinder we're leaving in the car, so when he paints, he will tape this stuff off. All these bolts, they gotta come out too, because if you leave them, they're gonna get painted. This is really the only place this car had any real body damage other than the paint being messed up, so this will have to get fixed before he paints it, otherwise that will look the way it looks. And the Fast and Furious car had painted white everything, so we're gonna do a similar theme to that. So these moldings are gonna be painted, so they're gonna have to get these sanded down and filled, and then painted. Same thing with the door handles and the mirrors. Now, instead of trying to have him do that, these things are pretty crusty and old, so I didn't have a lot of faith in them. So I have new door handles and new mirrors that we're gonna install in the car after he paints them. This is an antenna that Mark III's have from the factory. We're gonna remove this and actually fill that hole. As part of our paint prep, I'm going to be taking the door panels off. That way we don't have to worry about getting any overspray or anything. And I think Paul might be getting these recovered because they're kind of gross. Yucky don't to look at. Your car's gross. Yeah. 
Also, I very much dislike Mark III door panels. But at minimum, we need to paint the door, like the door jams and everything else so that like the car looks fully nice and painted. Not like halfway done where this like the outside looks pretty and the, you open the door and you're like, Ugh. So this is the old battery tray mount. We don't need that because we don't have a battery here. So we're gonna cut that off and then we're gonna, Steve's gonna help me weld some studs in here for grounding points at the front. Now we have a bunch of studs kind of throughout the engine compartment with these fancy, well-mannered little X's on them. These are gonna get cut off. So we're cutting some, we're welding some, because the Mark 7 has like 87 of these all for grounds on the frame rails. This is a Mark 3. It only had like 0.2 grounds for the whole car. I have reached my capacity for feeling comfortable taking this door panel the rest of the way off. Because <laughs> I really don't want to break it. So you want Paul to break it instead? Yep. I would much rather Paul break it than Charles break it. You hold the inner door handle open and you just pull it away and it comes right away. These seem to be different. Actually, you might be right. I don't want to pull it any more than that. <laughs> Someone's got to break it. I got it. Don't be. When I was a kid, there was a carpet store, but there was a divider and the text, so it said car pet. And I was like, man, it's pretty cool that people just have a pet for their car only. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yep. There we go. Oh, I just got a complete. Did you get a mouthful? Yeah. Oh, uh, more than a mouthful. It wasn't in my mouth, but it was oh. near was my mouth and all over my face. Can we go shake it? Should we go shake it? Yeah. Outside? Like this. Hey, uh, hey, That's uh, gross. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. I don't know if you can see that on camera. I don't know. But there's a cloud coming. Pull, up, pull, pull the carpet up. All that is from the carpet. All that dust. Yeah, this is all stuff we want. We gotta get rid of this. Oh, that collects water in that pad real yeah. bad. Yeah. little sound in there. So. Mm, that one's not good. They're like lead. Yeah, what are these weights? They're sound in there. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to get swole. It's like a it's like a really gross saddle that you mount. Yeah. What are you mounting? This car is mounted. This car is you, yeah. Buddy. It's more like it's mounted me. 100 backwards. Maybe it's some of that pure Colombian Bam Bam smuggled up in in the back floors of a Jetta, and they just forgot to take it out. So as Charles, Steve, and I got this car fully disassembled so it's ready for paint. The carpet, door panels headliner, engine, and all other trim pieces have been removed. This car is as fully stripped down as I'm willing to go without losing my mind. But before painting, this car is still disgusting from being old and a pile of shit. So we got our car loaded up and are bringing it to be clean. To get this car squeaky clean, we're bringing our car to Merit Motor Company. They specialize in dry ice blasting. This is something that has become very popular in the car restoration world. These are very expensive machines that are filled with pellets of dry ice. The small pellets of ice shoot out at supersonic speeds. This makes for a great way to get old off of old cars. Some brakes work. Oh! Oh! <laughs>
Jared split this right down the middle when he was dry ice blasting. So you can see down here, it made a much bigger difference than up here. Mostly because number one, this car is fairly new. You can see on the cam magnet, it's like much cleaner than the other one. The place that made a really huge impact, you can see right here. This aluminum has a straight line right on it. This bolt looks amazing, looks brand new. That one, not so much. So this is where you're gonna have like a lot of dirt collect, oil, just crud from the road. And that's where it's gonna make huge impact is all on stuff like that. So places where dry ice blasting really shines is places like this upper timing cover. You can see like all these edges in here, it would be almost impossible to get in there to clean literally in any other way. Maybe pressure washing, but then again, you're soaking the entire engine down to do it. And you're not gonna get the same pressure or focus you can get with dry ice to make this thing actually like new again. Our time here is rushed and we want to be respectful of their time, so we only did the underbody of this car, but if you were doing dry ice blasting, you could do things like inside of this here, our goose thing. If you have to fly south, your door handle here, where we removed our door handles, that could be all cleaned up. The car's getting painted, so it doesn't really matter about that. He said these type of trims clean up amazingly, as you saw with the rear bumper, the black trims clean up awesome, so that will help salvage that stuff. Things like this cowl here, there's a million versions of things you could clean. Once again, thank you to Jared at Merritt Motor Company for blasting our underbody so hard. Now the car is all cleaned up, it's time for paint. Andre at Custom Paint and Body in Kannapolis agreed to help us with this project and our absurdly tight timeline. He's going to be painting the whole exterior, door jams, engine bay, and body kit. His process starts by inspecting the body and identifying as many imperfections as possible. Once you put new paint on a car, it exposes a lot of imperfections that you otherwise wouldn't have seen. As you can see, our Jetta accumulated a lot of damage over its 30 year lifespan. And wouldn't you know it, Johnny Tran is here and he's still trying to get his pink slips. Next, it's time for filling and sanding the car to get it prepped for paint. This is a very tedious process that requires a lot of attention to detail. This will take about two to three weeks, which gives us plenty of time to work on the interior. So while this car is coming back from paint, we're gonna deal with this thing. Did you just get back from a picnic? So you may have seen during the process of this build, this sweet, sweet headliner that looks like a picnic blanket. Well, not only was it covered in this picnic blanket material, but as you can see, it's already pulling away. And the reason why is because it's super thin and not enough glue was used when it was covered. That this, the glue is bleeding through. Now this actually sticks there, that's kind of shocking. Anywho, you can see that's how easily, this is how easily it comes off. A few, a few highway poles with the windows down and this thing would have just come <laughs> flying right off. I've heard a trick that this is the best way to remove like this stuff from here. Cause you got to remove this to get good adhesion. And it looks like you can see all that stuff. See that? Oh. Now, oh. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna make a mess. But no, it's gonna make asbestos. Well, yeah, it's not good for your lungs. So you, you know, <laughs> just hold your breath while you're doing it. Now, because I'm both fancy and schmancy, this is the material I have chosen to do our headliner and our new rear shelf in. So this is like an ultra suede Alcantara type material. As you can see, it's black. Uh, that's what we're doing the headliner in. Look at that. Look at all that on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. I originally thought what I was taking off with a brush was just glue, but I quickly realized that, that the person who did the picnic blanket headliner didn't remove any of the original foam. If you don't remove the foam before installing new headliner material, you're setting yourself up for failure. This is because the old deteriorating foam doesn't give the new material anything to stick to. 
One of the things I found works best is this die grinder and these discs that are used for aluminum generally and these fingers don't damage it. Once the foam is completely removed with a clean surface, you can now install your new headliner material. So we take a little bit of spray glue, a little bit of patience, a little bit of help from your friend, and now you got yourself a non-picnic ass blanket ass having headliner. Now this car has black visors in it already, but the interior trim parts are this gray material. So we are gonna paint these to match everything else so they match our headliner. We're gonna start by trying to paint our dome light assembly. We can remove these lenses out of here like so. Then we're gonna clean this thing up. We're gonna start to clean this thing up with a little bit of soap and some water. Don't worry about the electronics because we're not turning this thing on for a long time. Before you paint things, you can't paint over dirt, or at least if you'd like the paint to stick, you can't. Uh, so we're cleaning it properly to get good adhesion. Let's see if our handles turn out as nice as our other stuff is. My guess is not as nice, because if you look, this is like really like yucky from just aging, which is why painting it is a better option than just cleaning it. Look at that. Look at that. Poopy? Less poopy. Because of the material this is made of, we're gonna start with our 3M sand-free adhesion promoter, and we're gonna spray it down. While it's still wet, we have our SEM color coat. So while our paint is drying, we need to figure out why our car wouldn't go into gear earlier. After lots of research online, I suspect that the mech unit inside the transmission will need to be immobilized or defeated to solve our problem. This is because we removed almost all the modules from the car and it doesn't play nice without them. Lucky for us, Ian at Reflect Tuning is in our area and he told me he could help solve our DSG woes. He plugged it into his computer and wiped the immobilizer off of the system. Bada bing, bada boom. He said he's confident that when we get the car back from paint, it'll drive. Now. The door panels on this car were extremely worn and the material was pulling away in some places. To fix this, I started by pulling the loose material completely away from the door panel. I then used our spray adhesive from our headliner to stick the material back onto the door card. Then I taped off the panels and used fabric paint to refinish our worn fabric. I went with black to fit with the rest of the interior color scheme. While we're screwing around painting interior parts like amateurs, Andre is laying down his first coat on the car. Once the main part of the body and the engine bay was painted, we picked up the car so Charles and I can get to work on reassembling it. In our next episode, we are going to put this car back together, drive it, get the body kit on, and have the car wrapped with our rowdy rocket man. Turn on notifications so you don't miss out on our finale in the coming weeks. Once again, big thanks to our main sponsors, Liquid Molly and Unitronic. Also, thank you to everyone else listed here who has contributed to this project in some way. And if you want our shop dap repair to build you one of these things, you can absolutely forget about it. They specialize in Volkswagen Audi repair, maintenance, diagnostic, and performance, and they are not going to build you a car like this one.